I'm Scott Finlay and I'll be your service coordinator today on this final day of January. We're finishing off, finishing off this month's focus of imagination with today's reflection from Reverend Cynthia and our guest, Michelle Benzamin Miki, entitled Imagining a World. Michelle is joining us from her art studio in Manzanilla Village in Southern California. So please have patience today if we experience any Zoom connection issues during the service. We'll be working hard behind the scenes to remedy any issue that pops up as quickly as we can. The rest of our crew today includes Jesse as our Zoom host, Karen as co-host, and Zandy, or excuse me, Sandy is at GNUUC serving as our chalice lighter. As Sandy lights our chalice today, I'll be reading some words by Sharon Wiley. Let this be the place you consider what you've never considered. Let this be the place you imagine for yourself something new and unthinkable. May this hour bring dreams of new ways of being in the world. Come, let us worship together. Although we are still physically distant, please feel free to contact GNUUC anytime you feel the need. Reverend Cynthia is glad to hear from you via email, text, or phone call. If you are new to GNUUC or possibly Unitarian Universalism, even if our mission appeals to you, it is critical to know that at GNUUC, you are not required to sign a statement of faith or swear to certain beliefs. We are a free church driven by a quest for truth as it is known by each person. Please join me in reading our covenant. We covenant together to make a welcoming community, to walk together in the way of truth and love, to seek the life of the spirit as it is known by each person, to support each other in thought, word, and deed as we work to build a better world. For our opening song, please join in singing Meditation of Breathing by Sarah Dan Jones. Yeah. 
morning, everyone. I haven't seen you for a couple weeks, uh, most of you, anyway, and a few things have happened. Uh, some things have, at least for now, gotten a little better. And, uh, and yet, what I'm hearing from people is this feeling of dread, a feeling like, well, a couple terrible things in the world got a little bit better, and so surely some shoe is going to drop at any moment. I know that's a part of my, uh, it's just a part of my emotional toolkit that I don't have to use all the time. But this idea of like, let's not be too happy because something bad will surely happen if we are. So you may be in that space. And uh, today's a good day uh, for us to, to finish uh, the January month and are talking about imagination. I have invited a guest. Uh, I think you'll enjoy meeting her and someone I love and know a lot too. Um, this time for all sages is for everyone. They always are. But I'm going to encourage you if you are able and if you want to, actually you can do this seated. You don't have to stand up to go ahead and, and move along with the dancers in this short uh, video. But you don't have to. If you want to, uh, if you want to close your video so you feel like no one's watching you and dance, you can do that. You can just move in your seat um, or your chair, or you can just watch. <laughs> but this is called the Elm Dance, and I first learned this at Manzanita Village, which is the home uh, and the retreat space uh, for Michelle and her wife Catriona. And I was going there when I lived in in California for a couple of years. So one thing that happened every morning was we gathered and we danced uh, to this music. And we had a, a brief explanation that they had learned it from their friend, uh, Joanna Macy, who uh, is still doing and has been doing uh, the work of uh, both hope and despair. And I learned a lot about despair uh, work from Joanna Macy and from Katriana and Michelle. Uh, how we can hold both the realities, uh, this existence, and also some hope. This dance uh, is uh, Latvian music written by, uh, excuse me, but I hope this is right, Aeva Akira Terra. And it, the dance uh, was started in, in Germany in the 1980s. Uh, Joanna Macy first learned it in 1992 when she traveled uh, to Chernobyl uh, to work with communities that had been impacted and were still being impacted uh, by the nuclear uh, disaster of Chernobyl. One of the last towns she went to was a town called uh, Novosibkov. And in this town, uh, it was one of the most contaminated and polluted of the small towns uh, in that, that part of Russia because um, what happened, and you may or may not have read about this, but uh, I know a lot about it because when I visited uh, Transylvania, the small towns where our Unitarian uh, sisters and brothers uh, and kinfolk are, are uh, were all affected uh, by the radiation from Chernobyl. And people still uh, have cancers and, and die early from it. Um, so in Novosibkov, uh, near the Russian border, uh, the clouds were seeded uh, in order to uh, make rain. And what happened was that carried the rain out away from the population centers, the big cities, um, but it, it took them into the countryside. And this small town in particular was, was very, very, and, and still is very contaminated. So the human costs and the costs to the earth uh, were massive. So this is a dance both of mourning and of hope. And we'll be watching the first part where the dancers just move, sway, and raise their arms uh, to almost to feel like trees, to feel like the elm tree. 
And the second part we'll do together when we get back together, and that is to continue the dance, but to name the things that we are holding hope for, uh, that we are holding in our hearts and um, that we love. So uh, enjoy, dance if you wish. Today is the uh, final day. Our monthly Share the Plate partner is Open Table Nashville. This nonprofit focuses on the need of our homeless citizens and neighbors. They advocate for the rights and needs of those impacted by our housing crisis through many different avenues, including the ones on your screen. Please donate as you are able in any of the ways shown on the left side of, this, of the screen. You're also welcome to mail a check to the church. The address can be found on our website, as well as the link to donate directly. Thank you for the generosity you have always shown as a congregation. And now uh, our meditation. Let 
believe we'll have uh, the poem right to us by the poet. And uh, it's a poem that's written for this particular uh, portrait. So it's bringing together art, poetry, and justice. This is Daryl Alejandro Holness reading my poem, Breaking and Entering for the Quarry, a social justice poetry database at Split This Rock. This poem is an ekphrastic poem written in response to the painting entitled Sleep by Kayende Wiley, painted with oil on canvas in 2008. Breaking and Entering. Only beasts are supposed to hibernate, but this brother has been lying there for years. Truth isn't a news headline. Between the lines lay his body, between brush strokes his soul ascends, doing those things portraits rarely capture, giving life, giving face, serving. A black man's body on display hangs in a museum. He appears wrapped in a bedsheet covering his private parts as if he was a sexless Christ, as if his private parts made him pray, or as if both pray and Jesus were one in the same. But perhaps it's just respectful to cover a dead man, or at least to cover where he may have been broken into. Praise to the angel who gave him wings of canvas and gesso paint. A better burial than the other brothers got. Those over there just left on the street. I take a few moments for contemplation. I'm so excited <laughs> to introduce Michelle to all of you. Uh, Michelle and Ketriana are such a blessing to me. Um, I first worked with Buddhist meditation and as I've told you, I'm not a Buddhist, but uh, Buddhist type meditation has been really helpful for me. And it's a funny thing, the more you practice, <laughs> the more helpful it is. And during this uh, pandemic, I've gotten to come back to them for a, a three days a week retreat. It's, it's been just miraculous. And um, Michelle has agreed to talk with us about imagination, uh, about her, her art. She's a visual artist and a performance artist. And she'll probably say a little more about that. Uh, and she also integrates her art with healing and personal trauma and social justice. Uh, she's worked with everyone from visionaries, uh, they were ordained by Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, to, to uh, people who have been uh, caught up in the prison system. And she's done a lot of work there. 
she's one of the highest ranked women in Aikido and Iaheido. If I said it wrong, please correct me. Um, that's a sword. So not only visual art, performance art, uh, the art of loving, I would call uh, their meditation teaching and also uh, martial arts. And uh, I've asked Michelle a question. I'll, I'll read the question to you and she can go anywhere she would like to go with this. So here was my question for her. Also, there'll be a little time for you to talk to her, either about her art or about some of her other activities. Um, my question was, how do you integrate your own imagination, your artistic pursuits, and your love for this broken world, and how do you stay hopeful? So, Michelle. I, um, I've been thinking about this question uh, since uh, you po posted on an email um, because it's something that used to motivate my artwork in the past. In fact, uh, the, two, uh, the two roads really never connected until I realized that I was really healing the brokenness inside of me by engaging my imagination and going into these realms and dream state and uh, simply portraying them, making them visible on canvas and through performance art as well. Uh, so it really healed me um, because obviously uh, I think we can all share this. Um, we were trained not to use our imagination. Uh, how many times have you found uh, when you go off into a daydream, especially when you're a younger kid in school, that you had to like focus, pay attention, uh, bring your head out of the clouds and be here now, which is great. It's purposeful, but we tend to make it a credo for the rest of our lives. And um, at an early age, um, that visioning ability and that imaginary place that we go to naturally as children gets closed and squashed in. And so we, we hide it and uh, perhaps we don't have access to it anymore. So I think for myself, that brokenness inside of me, I would allow myself to go there and go to this place of imagination, heal myself through that um, by painting and drawing. <clears throat> and to get back to the, the um, connection between uh, that brokenness inside of me, I realized I wasn't really broken. I, I had all the, the keys right there and I could just uh, use my imagination and skills to regain a sense of wholeness. And so I would bring that to the communities that I would serve um, that I resonated with as uh, at that time as broken but they weren't really broken. They just didn't have access to their original um, place, the place they knew that they were empowered. So I would go into, at the beginning, uh, the communities that were in prison and mostly the juvenile justice system and the probation camps. And I would teach skills of meditation, of using the power of imagination and also a nonviolent communication, nonviolent uh, presence which was something well needed in those institutions. They were very high stressed on top of um, a lot of people in trauma being together in those places. So I would teach them that. And through teaching that, I began to heal myself. And there's a thing that I wanna watch out with the word hope. And sometimes our hope can ambush us because we have great expectations. And we forget there's a natural rhythm to uh, life that we've, we knew when we were born that things take time and they take their own time. And they're there for a reason because the learnings come through that time. And if we have access to that through our imagination, then we have a better sense of healing and how long that takes and coming to wholeness again, which is our whole path when we're 
when we're born to when we die and who knows after that. Um, however, I bring this work into the communities and I would heal as well as interfacing with the healing and communication uh, to these young folks of, uh, they have the tools inside, even though they're locked down, they're in lockdown and we are too right now, right? <laughs> of a certain kind that we have the tools um, and uh, we've always had the key and the tools. And so I constantly would ask myself, uh, what if, what if this happened? Wouldn't that be interesting? And I'd keep my curiosity and my imagination, my investigative tools that I've always had as a child to unlock those tools and keep asking the question because I don't want the answer because that's a stuck place. You know, you think you solved everything and you're on some firm ground, but I want to continually challenge that with my imagination and get curious. So this would help me in those communities because a lot of times the story would be, oh, there's violence that's erupting in this particular room that I was in. And if I get caught up in that, then I'm trapped as well. I'm in that violence. So I would just step back and get curious and see the whole picture. And once I've gotten and gained rapport with myself, then I could really help the situation and engage in a whole different way. I would take back my power. So that would be empowering to, to these young people. And I've done this in the reservation communities around here because um, Manzanita Village is situated in a beautiful place with 19 reservation communities all around us. And I've had the privilege and the honor to go into those communities and serve and go figure, I teach imagination. I would teach meditation, I would teach nonviolence. And that was just a pretext to come in to really connect with people that had something for me as well. And I need to regain that. So we were in a feedback loop of uh, healing each other. I would have some tools, but in those tools, I wouldn't come there with this sense of colonizing. Yeah, right? And giving my perspective to somebody. I would come there and say, hey, these are tools that are just something that would unlock something familiar inside of you. And I would watch as this community would come together and sit in a big circle. And all I have to do is just catalyze it with a few breathing in, breathing out, connecting to source, inside, outside. And they would sit like they used to sit in circles long ago. And I could see that and it was beautiful. It was almost like the very person that I represented, even though I was also uh, in the oppressed category, being multiracial, um, I could unlock by giving back to a, a community that maybe I had some uh, history, ancestry of oppression uh, to those communities. I could give back by just simply um, engaging, connecting. So it's not about anybody healing anybody else. It's just about bearing witness like they do in the elm dance. You know, you saw these beautiful people swaying back and forth, connecting to a bigger picture of suffering and speaking out for those that are invisible, that are not championed, maybe disposable sacrificial and just speaking the name of those people out in the second part of the dance is what we used to do. And the empowerment that you get through connecting and grieving brings the best energy. Uh, it's important to really feel things and grieve. And that's what gives me, if I want to use the word hope, and the biggest and broadest way, that's what gives me hope. And it comes back into my art, just really fuels and generates a sense of purpose in my art and direction and storytelling. So thank you for the question, Cynthia. Thank you. Are you ready for another question? Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Rena. Uh, the next question, well, could you talk a little bit about your particular, some of your particular works of art that you uh, find most, have found most, uh, something you'd like to talk about and how that process has gone with yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, I'm situated in my studio and behind me you'll see uh, two pieces, uh, very large pieces. Um, and I'd like to describe them. Uh, they are done with a big brush stroke first. I take a big brush and I wad it with Japanese ink, a particular kind of really dark ink that has red and blue tones in it. And then I take this brush stroke, I, I do a little meditation first, clear my mind of any intention to create anything because I want to connect to a you know, unobstructive creativity that I have when, when I leave myself alone and just let my body express on paper. And then I just go into the paper and make contact and move my arm in a way that just feels unobstructed. And once that brush stroke is on the paper, like you'll see in both drawings, there's a big brush stroke to the right. Uh, and when I make this brush stroke, I don't leave, even though it looks like to the right here that there are many strokes. But once I start the energy, even when I put the brush on the paper, it lifts off, but my arm is still moving. And then I contact the paper again and I lift off and I contact the paper again. That's one brush stroke. To the left here, there is one brush stroke. And I did this one the brush stroke after I created the drawing. So it was another risk that I took there. Yeah, I invested so much time. And the drawing on this brush stroke here is this piece is called Elevation. And there's a woman's figure here whose chest is wide open. And she's leaning back as far as she can and letting everything open up. And her arms are stretched out and reaching some kind of a connection. Uh, her, even her fingers on, on that side of her hand that's visible are turning white because she's like disappearing into that connection. And her hair is streaming down and making this huge web connecting to all of life. And then her body goes down into this big breaststroke now, after I did the body, I, I took the risk. I'm going to make this brush stroke. And I'm just going to do it. So I made this big brush stroke. So it looks like she's being propelled by this brush stroke. She's being elevated. And on the right side here, I did the brush strokes first. And then I just sat with it, like I do with paintings, and said, "Is does this work? Is this abstraction, does it work? Is it finished? And I just know it intuitively that it works because I have some design training, but I also just use the tools of um, the Japanese brushstroke painting, which is when you create something, you're considering the space around it as well as the space that, that, that you're pulling forward into visibility with the brushstroke. So the space around it gives it context and space. So when the viewer looks at it, they have space. They don't get crowded with your stories and they can create for themselves when they see something, a world of their own through their own perception. So this came first. And then I looked at it and I said, nah, it needs something. I wanna put something inside that bubble that I created. So it has a big circle there and leading down into the, the bottom there. And so I created this woman in the center of that circle and her back is facing on us and her hands are pushing out of that bubble like she's creating momentum by pushing out whatever it is that's restrictive, whatever it is that confines her space, she keeps making more space by pushing out. And so this piece is about the imagination, how we have to always test it with the truth, which is truth to me is what is useful in the moment and it's always challenged with our creativity and our imagination. So it's a living thing. Truth is always living. It's not fixed. 
And so she's doing that, she's pushing out of that. And that's what I do with my work. I'm continually challenging, pushing to another level. And I must say that everybody's an artist. I wanna get back to that question that Reverend Cynthia actually asked uh, once before. Everybody's an artist. I really truly believe that. <clears throat> we were all born with that imagination and creativity. That's our gift as we developed our sense doors and physicality that could make contact with the world so intimately. We were born with this imagination and this ability to be curious and continually challenge the world uh, through our perceptions. We're making up reality all the time for ourselves through our own history. And that's the wounded place possibly that we must transform through creativity and however you do it. And you probably remember a time where you were singing, dancing, writing, painting, drawing, sculpting, making poetry, making art in some way, sand castles on the beach, making footprints on the sand and walking and making stories up from stuffed animals and having communication with them. And we always had that ability to interface in and with the world in a creative way. So ask yourself the question, for who, whom does it serve for you to not call yourself an artist in some way? The word artist has been uh, capitalized and it's been uh, commodified. And it's also been schooled in a particular way where there's the authority that says, now you're an artist, I stamp this diploma, here you go out into the world. And sometimes that learning, you have to unlearn all of that because it kind of gets you over critical. So you must put the critic to a better, better occupation. Ask your critic inside. Do more for me. You're coming with the same questions all the time. I want you to really help me now. So how can you do that? Just create something. And I want to also talk about just one more thing. When, when you make pictures and images up in your mind, Be careful around what images that you bring close to you, okay? So some of those images are the world, it's a terrible place, it's a battleground. And if you ever have those images, know that those are stories that were told to you long ago. And so now take those stories, imagine that they're very close to your skin and a big picture and move it away it's not to say you're pushing away information. You're just pushing away those horror stories. Push it way out. Can you push it out, way out in the distance and let it go down into the ocean somewhere and... And now bring the story in. Bring this world that is already healing and beautiful, constantly regenerating. Bring that picture right up in front of you now. If you can do that right now, what would it be like? It would be rich and vibrant and colorful and full of plant life and flowers and sky and bring that picture right in close to your heart. Now step into that picture and imagine a world like that. Imagine other people with you. And that's a beautiful thing. Practice your imagination. Every day, bring in a picture that you'd like and step into it. And if you get a scary story, like move that picture far away so you have some distance and perspective on it. Challenge it. So. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I, I wanted to mention uh, for John, if John is here, that the picture that I showed during the poem was a portrait of a young 
uh, black male lying on his back in a very similar kind of reclining position as Jesus when he was taken off the cross, or at least what art depicts him. And um, I thought of that, Michelle, with you because to me well first first of all i i should say this the person who painted that is kehende wiley and he painted those portraits of uh, president obama and michelle obama mm -hmm. and also the picture of brianna taylor uh, who was killed here in, in kentucky in louisville that went on the cover of oprah magazine the first time oprah was not on the cover of room like i think they <laughs> painted a, a portrait of her also so that's just a little context. But when I first met you, um, I didn't feel like I knew you as well as I knew Patriana, but um, to me, you were, and the art that I saw around there at Manzanita Village was so much about the beautiful body, you know, these beautiful uh, feminine, mostly mm -hmm. feminine bodies. Yeah. Um, but they, but nonetheless, they were expressing a whole range of emotions. You know, they weren't beautiful in like the beauty contest being paraded. Mm -hmm. Then they were. But I wonder how, if you've grappled with aging body, the, you know, the fat body, the, yeah, the luster <laughs> silvery. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think. Uh... When an artist paints or draws, it's almost like each piece is a part of that person. Mm -hmm. So each piece is coming from uh, some place that they resonate with. So I like, and I have uh, practice always, um, some kind of a kinesthetic art or martial art or meditative art or something. And so I, I, when I do bodies, I like the musculature. I love the anatomy. I love for that to really like, I, I love to like the earth. It's so topographical and, you know, so my paintings and my drawings tend to be of that. I really enjoy going through the musculature of, a, and, the, you know, almost showing the bones of that, that person. So they tend to be in that, that way, expressive of that. And I love, I love that. Um, I haven't been drawn to doing anything except for my grandmother, uh, mm. who is, uh, uh, was 89 when she died. I painted this painting uh, when she was 84. And um, she's the only person that I've ever, ever did a portrait of that um, displayed, and she's my matriarch, she's my, my soul, my inspiration. And she's in my studio. She's the only piece that I'm not selling because she's not, not a piece to sell. She's my altar in the studio. So I have, and one time I was uh, visited by um, a woman you know, during a show and uh, she, said, she said to me directly the same thing. Where are all the lines and the the uh the aging and the where are all those those aspects where where are all the you know the other bodies that you don't represent here in your work and i I've, I've sat with that question for a long time and as an artist they'll come if they need to come but for right now um uh i'm i'm replicating uh what I love and I love the human body and I love the musculature. Yes. I think we are just fascinating the way we are made up and I'm gonna show that on camera. So gonna, and the, a lot of the paintings, uh, I do the back of the woman uh, because uh, yeah. there's an intimacy yeah. uh, with the back and you yeah. know, uh, there's a strength in the back and the musculature of the back. And I wanna display that, um, that strength as a woman, because we always see her frontally. Oh, right. And we always kind of have whatever we have around that. Uh -huh. You know, the colonization of the woman's body frontally. But now I want to show the back and how strong the woman's yeah. back is. She's yeah. been a support and a pillar yeah. of the community. Yeah. And uh, I want to show that. Right. So that's where my art is right now. I noticed in myself that I'm so much more drawn to these here 20 years 
you know, later, 20, 24 years later on, because I feel more comfortable in my own body, <laughs> even though it's mm-hmm. gotten older, even though it's, you know, chubbier is, it's, it's more feels like home to me. You know, my head yeah. doesn't feel like it's somewhere. <laughs> I think it's a James Joyce story where Mr. Uh, what was his name? He lives, <laughs> he lives at some distance from his body, you know? Yes. Uh, I think that's a very Euro, uh, Euro American thing is to just e- even if we don't hate our bodies, just feel kind of disconnected mm-hmm. from them. And I have, you know, I-, I think I have gotten in a much better place with my own physical being. And now, I see, when I see your art, uh, I love the ones with the women's backs. Um, people can see uh, Michelle's art on her website. Oh, there it is. So it's in the. Um, it's also on Facebook. And uh, it's very easy to remember her website. But if you if you don't get it, you can give me a buzz and I'll tell you. Uh, and her art, some, much of her art is also for sale. Um, okay, let's move on with the service. And if you have other questions, thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you have other uh, questions, and again, there's on their website, they do a lot of other uh, personal counseling and things like that. So you can... You can make connection with them if you like. Um, all right, Scott, you're going to. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Cynthia, and thank you, Michelle, for joining us today. Uh, now, uh, everyone, please uh, sing along to Filled with Loving Kindness. <laughs> the time that uh, during our service we shared its joys and concerns. Thank you to all of you that uh, joined us through uh, YouTube today. Jesse, our Zoom host, will now turn off our YouTube stream.